Welcome to Know Your Stuff, a program aimed at educating on historical developments and societal concepts. My name is Zan Raza. Today I'm joined by Peter Kuznick, Professor of History and the Director of Nuclear Studies at the American University. He's also the author of numerous books, and the book that we will be specifically discussing today is called The Untold History of the United States. Peter Kuznick wrote this book together with film director and producer Oliver Stone. Peter Kuznick, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm looking forward to this discussion. Me too. Glad to be with you. So let's start with your book that you co-authored with Oliver Stone. Can you introduce the book, talk about why you decided to write it, and also list some facts that do not appear in mainstream historical discourse? Well, Oliver and I were having dinner in 2007, and we were talking about history and politics like we always do. And in the middle of it, Oliver says to me, Peter, let's do a documentary. Uh, and he had the idea we'd do a one-hour documentary on the origins of the Cold War and the atomic bombings in 1945. I went to see him in New York the next week. Now he had the idea for a 10-hour, 10 10-part 10 documentary film series. We ended up doing 12 hours. And midway through that process, we decided we needed to add a book because the amount of information we could convey in 58 minutes and 30 seconds was very frustrating, even if Oliver spoke quickly. Uh, so uh, we ended up initially, we thought maybe a tough coffee table book like the Ken Burns books, uh, but then the publishers all wanted a serious book, which I was much happier to do. So we ended up writing an 800 page book uh, that uh, got here. I think you showed it, The Untold History of the United States. Uh, and we also put out uh, a but a concise untold history of the United States, uh, which is not abridgment, it's really uh, based on the documentary scripts. But the big book, you know, Oliver's got a controversial reputation. And the films like JFK, we knew we were going to get attacked. So we've got more than 100 pages of footnotes in the, in the big book. Uh, we've now finished writing the new edition, which comes out in early April, and it's going to be up more than 900 pages. We added a 150-page chapter on what's happened in the world between 2012 and 2019. So it takes us right up to the present. So the initial idea was it was going to be a history of the American empire and national security state. Uh, and we called it the untold history of the United States. We grappled with different titles, try to figure out the best one. We decided this, uh, and it starts really in the late 19th century. Because one of the turning points in American history is the Spanish-American War in 1898, followed by the U.S. occupation of the Philippines in 1899, and the massacre that goes on there for the next few years. So the United States began to change. Whereas the United States was once a leading uh, democratic, even pro-revolutionary nation, having been born in revolution itself, the United States gradually becomes the world's leading counter-revolutionary force. But then the United States starts intervening in country after country, initially mostly in Central America and South America. Uh, but after the U.S. involvement in World War I, the U.S. starts to take more of a global role. And, the US, and uh, New York replaces London as a center of world finance. Uh, so, but the real big turning point for us comes with World War II. Uh, not only the defeat of fascism and uh, Japanese militarism, but the use of the atomic bomb and then the start of the Cold War. So the world dramatically changes. The United States begins to acquire a real global empire. We get a lot of bases from the Brits in exchange for the uh, warships that we were giving them. And we create this global network. Uh, uh, by 1948, you've got George Kennan, the architect of the Cold War, the architect of US containment policy, uh, writing a secret memo in which he says, we've got 6.3% of the world's population yet we control 50% of the world's wealth. The challenge that confronts us in this coming period is to maintain that position of disparity. We're not going to do so with 
idealistic slogans and freedom of the press and, and stressing freedom, we're only going to do that with hard power concepts. <clears throat> and that really is going to define the U.S. approach toward the Cold War. In 1949, in August, the Soviets test their atomic bomb. In 1949, the Chinese Revolution occurs and the formation of NATO. <clears throat> and we're going to see the hardening of those lines 1950 to 53, we've got the Korean War, which still is not officially ended. Uh, and and so we, then we go to this period in the 50s. In fact, it's interesting that in a year ago, 2018, January, the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists moved the hands of the doomsday clock to two minutes before midnight, the closest we've been since the early 1950s. And what triggered it in the ni in 1952-53 was the U.S. test of the hydrogen bomb and then the Soviet test of a proto-hydrogen bomb in 53. And so they moved the hands to two day, minutes before midnight then, and now we're back at two minutes before midnight. So these are the kinds of issues that Oliver and I are looking at. The history of the militarization of the planet, consequences of the Pax Americana, in which the United States, well, you look at it globally, the richest eight people in the world, more wealth than the poorest 3.6 billion people. I mean, that's the crazy world that we've constructed, a world in which two countries, the United States and Russia, control 93% of the world's nuclear weapons. Two people, Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin, have veto power over the continued existence of our species. These are the things that trouble us. The fact that the U.S. is now bombing nine countries. Who does such things? The U.S. has an empire of 800 bases. Now, so we get at this whole question of American exceptionalism, which is at the core of so much of what America does. The idea that the United States is not only different from all other countries, but the United States is better than all other countries. The idea that, that the United States, whereas other countries are motivated by wanting more territory, or power, or political uh, control, or military strength. The United States only wants to spread freedom and democracy. That's the vision that Americans are taught from the beginning, that we're benevolent, we're altruistic, we're generous, we're peace-loving. The reality is, unfortunately, very, very different. And so in that kind of world, we're trying to make sense out of what's happening and what should be happening instead. So talk about the sourcing of your book. How did you source a book and make your historical case as opposed to how traditional mainstream uh, historical books are written? I, I would not say that we're so fundamentally different because academia in the United States and much of the rest of the world is really a bastion of progressivism. Our interpretations are much more in line with left-wing academics in the United States. And left-wing dominates most like the historical profession, certainly, and a lot of other important social sciences, arts, and humanities. So we're not really out of step with them. What we're out of step with is what's taught in the high schools. What's the vision you get on television? Uh, and, and so it's a fairly traditional in that sense. We had, I had eight of my PhD students on the payroll as researchers. Uh, we were just re devouring everything. We did a lot of documentary research also in, in terms of the documents and the, uh, and the National Security Archive and the Cold War International History Project. I mean, there's a lot of very, very good sources out there. So the problem wasn't finding the material. The problem was shaping it into a narrative that made sense and one that could appeal to people. So what we did is we've got 12 hour 12-part documentary film series that's out. It was on Showtime here, 10 hours, and then it played all over the world, well, except for China. Uh, but then the book is out, and the big book is out in about 20 languages, uh, and we're still working on more. Uh, the um, small book, The Concise Untold History, is out in a lot of languages, and I think that's the one that's in Germany, uh, this one. Uh, as a, And then we've got the second volume of our four volume Young Readers edition just came out this past week. Uh, so that's for middle school and younger high school students. 
And now we've also got a graphic novel on the way. So what we're doing is trying to reach people any possible way we can, get them to just start questioning more, start thinking, developing counter narratives, uh, different ways of looking at the history of our planet for the past 120 plus years. You mentioned uh, nuclear weapons and uh, the fact that the atomic scientists have moved the clock two minutes to midnight. I want to get to where it all started, and that's one of the chapters of your book deals with that, Japan. Uh, what really happened during the end of World War II uh, when the atomic weapons were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki? The perception here in Germany is it was, uh, our, it was essential for the U.S. to do that uh, so the war could end. However, you provide a different perspective in your book. Could you please talk about that? Well, my students have to sit through a 12-hour lecture on this topic. I'll try to consolidate it a little bit. Um, the basic facts that people need to know. After the Battle of Saipan in July of 1944, the Japanese knew they were defeated. Uh, they had no more prospect for a traditional military victory. They began doing secret studies about how to end the war. In February 1945, Prince Kanoe, the former prime minister, wrote a memo to the emperor saying, I regret to tell you, but defeat is inevitable. The real challenge we have is to figure out how to prevent the communist revolution in the event of our surrender. Uh, U.S. intelligence had been basically saying the same thing. We showed that their transportation system was collapsing, the food supply was shrinking, access to energy was, was diminishing. Uh, the Japanese were in a lot of ways de defeated, but the American strategy was that we would have to have a blockade, we'd have to bomb their cities, and we'd have to invade. And so the belief in the United States, and this is the public misperception, was that if the United States had not uh, dropped the atomic bombs, then the U.S. would have had to invade Japan, and that uh, Truman writes in his memoirs that Mar General Marshall told him that a half million boys would be lost in the invasion. Some estimates were a trillion, uh, I mean a, mil a million. Uh, uh, and so in that situation, that was the justification, that the atomic bombings were actually a humane act that it not only saved a half million American lives, but millions of Japanese who had been killed in the invasion. So Truman did a great thing by using the atomic bombs rather than invading. The reality is totally different, 180 degrees different. The reality is the Japanese were already militarily defeated and were searching for a way to end, end the war. We know this because we had broken the Japanese codes early on in the war. We were intercepting their telegrams, and the Japanese were, had decided that their best way to get better surrender terms, well, the surrender terms is a big issue. The U.S. was demanding unconditional surrender, which to Japan meant the execution of the emperor as a war criminal. To the Japanese, the emperor was a god. And MacArthur's Southwest Command issues a background report in the summer of 45 that says the execution of the emperor to them would be like the crucifixion of Christ to us, all would fight to die like ants. We knew that. The Japanese would never accept unconditional surrender in that way. So one way to end the war was to change the surrender terms. Roosevelt dies on April 12th, 1945. The person who should have replaced him was his former vice president, Henry Wallace. When, uh, to get, not to get too convoluted here, but the Democratic Convention, July 20, began July 20th, 1944. Gallup issued a poll asking people who they wanted on the ticket as vice president. 65% of American voters said they wanted Henry Wallace back on the ticket as vice president. 2% said they wanted Harry Truman. But the party bosses controlled the convention and they put Truman there instead of Wallace. Oliver and I argued that had Wallace been back on the ticket as vice president, become president on April 12th, there would have been no atomic bombing in World War II and probably no Cold War. But that's another discussion. But Truman is in, in power now. All of Truman's advisors, except for Jimmy Burns, are urging him to change the surrender terms. 
that, that the Japanese know they can keep the emperor. Uh, Truman refuses to do that. Bush told him he'd be politically crucified if he let the Japanese keep the emperor. So that's one way to end, end the war sooner. And we know that because the cables, so the Japanese strategy, rather uh, ill-conceived, was to try to get the Soviets to intervene on their behalf to get them better surrender terms. What they didn't know is that we had a deal and at Yalta, uh, Roosevelt finally got Stalin to agree to come into the Pacific War three months after the end of the war in Europe. In exchange for that, the Russians were gonna get a lot of concessions that they wanted. So the Russians didn't have any interest in helping the Japanese get better surrender terms before Russia got into the war. But the other way to end the war was wait for the Soviet invasion, which was scheduled to begin around August 8th, August 9th, three months after the end of the war in Europe. Uh, and American, US intelligence and British intelligence have been saying for months that as soon as the Soviets enter the war, that all Japanese will know that further resistance is futile, that it will end the war almost immediately, the Soviet entry itself. <clears throat> So the Soviets do enter, but to back up even a little bit more, Truman arrives at Potsdam, I think it was July 15th. Stalin assures him the Russians are coming in on schedule. Truman writes in his diary that night, Stalin will be in the Jap war by August 15th. Finny Japs when that occurs. He knew the Japanese were finished when the Russians, the Soviets invaded. He writes home to his wife, Bess, the next day and says the Russians are coming in We'll end the war a year sooner now. Think about the kids who won't be killed. You know, Truman knew that. And Truman refers on July 18th to the intercepted Japanese telegram as, quote, the telegram from the Jap emperor asking for peace. So the, the, clearly the American leaders all knew that the Japanese were finished, that there were two ways to end the war without using the atomic bombs and that the Soviets knew better than anybody how desperate the Japanese were to surrender because a former Prime Minister Hirota had met a couple of times with the Soviet ambassador in Tokyo, Malik, and Malik writes back to the Kremlin that the Japanese are desperate to surrender. This is in, in June and July. So when the, the atomic bomb, then the question is, so why does the United States use the bomb? Truman is not bloodthirsty, he's not Hitler. Uh, but the United States' primary motive in using the bomb was to send a message to the Soviets that if they mess with US plans in Europe or in Asia, this is what's gonna happen to them. And that's exactly how uh, all the Soviet leaders interpret it. That the bomb was not dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the bombs were dropped on Moscow and St. Petersburg. Uh, so, so that that was really uh, what was going on, and so it's it's a key factor in the start of the Cold War, because we were the U.S. and the Soviets were still allies at that point, and there were a lot of forces that were trying to hold us together. The Cold War is a disastrous period in human history. We're lucky to have survived it, and the U.S. then has an atomic monopoly, which we continue to build up. The Soviets test their bomb in August of 49, and we've got the race for the hydrogen bomb. But uh, And then we got to the point, I used to, I take students every summer on a study abroad trip to Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It's a class we offer at American University. And I'd always find myself writing down the same inscription from the display at the Hiroshima A-bomb museum, that by 1985, the world had accumulated the equivalent of 1.47 million Hiroshima bombs. We had 70,000 nuclear weapons. What do we need one and a half million Hiroshima bombs for? How many times over do we have to kill everybody on this planet? And we still have that capability. If we've got some time, I'd be happy to talk about nuclear winter in the current state of the nuclear insanity. So I just want to summarize this as short as I can. So. If I understood you correctly, an undemocratic leader in Truman comes into power, sidelining a progressive. And this leader, President Truman, knew that uh, there are better terms of surrender, there's a better way to go around it, yet chooses to bomb uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, 
thereby igniting the Cold War in the situation we are today. Is, is this a fair way to put it? Uh, it's actually even worse. <laughs> the Truman knew and said on at least three occasions explicitly, he understood he was beginning a process that could end all life on the planet. His first big briefing on the bomb, he was vice president for 82 days. Nobody had enough regard for him to even tell him that we were building an atomic bomb. He doesn't even find out about the bomb project uh, till after he's sworn in at the emergency cabinet meeting on the night of April 12th. And uh, um, Stimson mentions it to him, Secretary of War Stimson, but he says, I was distracted. I didn't really pay any attention. The next day, Jimmy Burns flies up from South Carolina and he has any briefs Truman about what's going on. Truman writes in his memoir, he says, Jimmy Burns said, a weapon great enough to destroy the whole world. Truman gets a full briefing on April 25th from General Groves, the head of the Manhattan Project and Secretary of War Stimson. And Truman comments after that, that Stimson said, even if we had the bomb, maybe we should never use it because it could end up ending life on the planet. Truman says, and I agreed with him. Then when Truman's at Potsdam on July 25th, he gets a full briefing on how powerful the bomb test at Alamogordo, New Mexico was. And Truman writes in his journal that night, we've discovered the most terrible bomb in history, says, quote, this may be the fire destruction prophesied in the Euphrates Valley era after Noah and his fabulous ark. To kill hundreds of thousands of innocent people in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, women and children, is a war crime. But to threaten or begin a process that you know, know could end all life on the planet goes far beyond that. And that's the reality that we've lived with ever since. So the story, United States had eight five-star admirals and generals in 1945. Seven of them are on record saying that the atomic bombings were either militarily unnecessary, morally reprehensible, or both. <clears throat> the chair, Truman's personal chief of staff was Admiral William Leahy who also chaired the meetings of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Leahy said the Japanese were already defeated in, before the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. He said use of this horrific weapon put us on the moral level of the barbarians of the Dark Ages. General MacArthur, who wanted to use atomic bombs in Korea, MacArthur said the Japanese would have surrendered in May, three months earlier, if we told them they could keep the emperor. Uh, Eisenhower, that was briefed by Stimson at Potsdam about the imminent use of the bomb. And Eisenhower said, I got very depressed. And then he asked me for my opinion. So I told him my war in Europe was already over. He said, but listening to you, I got so depressed. He said, first of all, uh, the Japanese were already defeated and there was no need for such a weapon. Number two, I hated to see our country be the first to use such a weapon. Uh, but, but we can look at the same kind of comments from the other top military leaders. So, and, and now if you go, and what finally ends the war is not the atomic bomb, it was the Soviet invasion. That's what changed the equation. The United States has been firebombing Japanese cities for months now. We have firebombed more than 100 Japanese cities. Destruction reached as high as 99.5% in the city of Toyama. The Japanese accepted that we could firebomb and wipe out their cities. They accepted that. To them, it didn't make a big difference if it was one plane and one bomb or 200 planes and 10,000 bombs. They accepted we could wipe out their cities. What changed the equation was the vast Red Army that they had dreaded all along invading in Manchuria, in the Kuril Islands, in Sakhalin. Uh, and, and as Prime Minister Suzuki says, on August 10th, he was asked why the Japanese had to surrender so quickly. He says, well, they've already blown through our, the Kwantung army in Manchuria. Uh, they've taken Karafuto. Tomorrow they'll be in Hokkaido. The foundation of Japan will be destroyed. We have to surrender while we can surrender to the Americans. And so the United States does let them keep the emperor ultimately, because uh, it was in the US interest to maintain stability afterwards. But if you go to the official US Navy Museum in Washington, DC, it's got a display now that says correctly 
that there was almost no discussion in the Japanese cabinet of the atomic bombs. Uh, the discussion all focused on the Soviet invasion, and that's what convinced them to end the war. And we knew that. Our intelligence was saying that that would be the case. So the, the world gets off to a pretty horrific start uh, in 1945, the end of the war and the beginning of the nuclear arms race. Let's pick up on that. Since uh, World War II, even though there was a big escalation in the nuclear arsenal and many more countries joined the club, there were certain safeguards when it came to ballistic missiles, nuclear um, weaponry that were put in place. Can you talk a bit about the history of all these treaties that were signed um, and whether they achieved their goal and what their statuses are today? Well, there were the SALT treaties, but the major treaties were the ABM Treaty, the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, which the United States abrogated in 2002, the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty. Now, the Europeans understand how important that was, because you had the Tomahawk and Pershing missiles that the U.S. put into Germany and other parts of Europe, and the Soviets had the SS-20s, and if those were fired at each other, we had about a 10-minute warning time on that. At least the ICBMs, you have a 30-minute warning time. But there was that, but when you have such a short window, you've got to decide immediately. And the intelligence is often flawed, as we've seen and we can talk about. So the INF Treaty was an important one. Donald Trump has now announced that he wants to withdraw from the INF Treaty also. So you've got the ABM Treaty gone. The INF Treaty is going to be gone. The first phone conversation between Putin and Donald Trump after Trump was elected, Putin says to him, we need to extend, we need to talk about extending the New START Treaty. The New START Treaty limited the number of nuclear weapons and launchers. Uh, and so that was the last restraint on the nuclear arms race, nuclear anarchy. And so Trump, as uh, so Putin says, we need to extend it when it expires in 2021. Trump puts down the phone and asks his advisors in the room, what's the new START treaty? They tell him what it is. He gets back on the phone. He says, no, no, we don't like that one either. We're not going to extend that. I mean, and so that's what's so frightening about what's going on now. Trump says, uh, what's the point of having nuclear weapons if we can't use them? To the same human being, that means let's get rid of them. To Donald Trump, it means let's make them more usable. So in February of 2018, Trump issued his new nuclear posture review, which not only talks about developing new weapons, it talks about making smaller weapons that'll be more usable. But you can't just blame this on, on Trump because he's got a lot of uh, co-conspirators when it comes to wanting to end life on the planet. Among them was Barack Obama. Remember in 2009, Obama won the Nobel Peace Prize for his Prague speech calling for nuclear abolition. You know, we thought that was strange at the time, a man waging two wars and bombing other countries would, would get the Nobel Peace Prize, but it was a recognition of his call for nuclear abolition. Well, as he says in that speech, the United States won't be the first country to abolish its nuclear weapons, will be the last country. And he was uh, certainly true to that word. Uh, and. Obama began a 30-year modernization program. It was supposed to be a trillion-dollar modernization program of the, every aspect of the nuclear arsenal. Now the official estimate is 1.2 trillion. The unofficial estimate is 1.7 trillion. The goal of that was to make nuclear weapons more efficient and more usable. And, and so this is Obama's legacy, uh, which Trump has now picked up on and is doubling down on. So in response to the American modernization, all nine nuclear powers are modernizing their nuclear arsenals. In Vladimir Putin's State of the Nation address, March 1st, 2018, Putin said, announced that Russia has developed five new nuclear weapons, all of which can circumvent U.S. missile defense. Uh, and, and so, but we see this everywhere, uh, this, this march, this rush toward insanity on a global scale. We have the nuclear insanity, uh, and they're going to probably move the hands of doomsday clock even closer to midnight on January 24th. And so we've got that coming, but we also have the climate insanity. You know, the, the experts have said there's been a one, one degree Celsius rise 
in uh, global warming since the Industrial Revolution. The, the leading experts said the planet can tolerate with damage a two degrees Celsius rise uh, uh, at, at most. If we go beyond that, then we're going to look at, you know, a three degree Celsius rise means much of India and China becomes uninhabitable. It means that the coastal cities have to be abandoned. It means the polar ice caps melt. Island nations will be submerged between the level water. It'll be a disaster. Now, a lot of the experts are saying we hope for a three degree Celsius rise. Some are saying that four degrees Celsius, uh, the World Banks and others are predicting that it could be as much as four degrees Celsius. Five degrees in human civilization is finished. And so do we have any kind of real leadership about this or leadership on any of these issues? That's what troubles me so much. I looked at our leaders, you know, and they're all pygmies. They're all nationalists. Trump's slogan, make America great again, endorsing American nationalism. You know, but, and, you know, Putin might be a little bit better, but he's not providing the kind of planetary leadership that we need. Xi Jinping, the stuff he's doing, the Chinese are doing in the South China Sea makes no sense to me, this nine dash line. There's enough wealth and resources to be shared. And, and, so, and we have nobody who's speaking for humanity. We have nobody who's speaking for the planet. Uh, and I just got back from India uh, and I was going to meet with Rahul Gandhi. We weren't able to do it. There's new elections in India in May. Uh, there's a good chance that Rahul Gandhi, at the head of a broad progressive coalition, could become the next prime minister. India will soon outstrip China in terms of population. By 2030, India will be the second biggest economy in the world. And we need to have, and India's got traditions, going back to Gandhi, going back to Nehru. Nehru not only led the third world movement against the US and Soviet blocs, he also led the movement for nuclear abolition to stop nuclear testing. India's got these proud traditions. And so, and so what we need is some leaders. I could see an axis between uh, Rahul Gandhi and Moon Jae-in. I mean, why did we have progress in India? Not because of the clown in Washington, you know, Diaper Donald, not because of him. We have progress in India because the, I mean, in, in Korea, because there was a candlelight revolution that brought Moon Jae-in to power and Moon Jae-in took tremendous initiative toward North Korea and the North Koreans responded. Trump tried to sabotage it initially. We thought a year ago that we were on the verge of war. The head of the Council on Foreign Relations said that there was a 50% chance of the US going to war with North Korea. You know, it was that dangerous situation. But Moon Jae-in took the initiative, and I could see a force, a counterforce of nations wanting to really support peace and development and disarmament beginning to emerge, maybe around Rahul Gandhi and Moon Jae-in and some others coming on board with that, rather than the warmongering that we see on the planet now. Could you talk about, uh, given that there's a complete media blackout on this issue, there's no discussions and analysis or solutions being presented, uh, could you quickly talk about what individuals could do to help make people conscious about this and bit connect uh, the nuclear movement of the 80s and what young people could learn from that today? In five minutes, please. <laughs> um, the nuclear movement in the 80s is a good example because we had the beginning of what felt like then the new Cold War. After the period, after the Cuban Missile Crisis to the early, to the election of Ronald Reagan, there was a period of relative quiet in which the nuclear issues kind of disappeared. Then when Reagan came in there and talking about the axis of, well, his version of that, the evil empire, and building up America's defenses and America's nuclear capabilities, and the Russians responding, and the sense of a new Cold War all over the planet again, the world responded with a tremendous anti-nuclear movement. My friend Jonathan Schell wrote a fabulous book called The Fate of the Earth. Uh, but there was a march of a million people in Central Park, anti-nuclear march in Central Park, New York. Among the participants was a young Columbia undergraduate named Barack Obama, who uh, actually marched there, which is why I trusted 
that he maybe was sincere about wanting to get rid of nuclear weapons. Uh, but then they, we went to sleep after mm -hmm. that. Gorbachev reached out. And the, after the meeting at Reykjavik in 1986, when we came within one word of abolishing nuclear weapons, if Reagan were willing to limit the testing of Star Wars, his stupid fantasy, uh, into the, limited to the laboratory for 10 years, Gorbachev was going to sign an agreement to get rid of all nuclear weapons. We came so close to Reykjavik. The INF Treaty was kind of the booby trap prize for not have, for having failed on getting rid of nuclear weapons completely. Uh, and but since then, you thought then with the end of the Cold War in 1991, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the end of the Cold War, we were going to have a period of peace and detente. What happens instead? The, so you, George H.W. Bush praises Gorbachev for his restraint in Germany and Eastern Europe. Uh, and what does the U.S. do? Invades Panama. The U.S. Goes inv gets involved, invades in the Gulf War, first Gulf War. The, the neocons who were just forming in that period, led by Charles Krauthammer. In 1990, Krauthammer writes an article and gives talks. He says, this is the, uh, the unipolar moment. The United States is the unipolar force in the world. We are the world's great hegemon. Nobody can challenge us anywhere. Uh, and he says the unipolar moment could last 20 or 30 years. By 2003, after the invasion of Afghanistan, uh, Proudhammer writes a new piece in which he says it's no that I underestimated it in 1990, 90, It's not a unipolar moment. It's a unipolar era. And he says this could last indefinitely, could last hundreds of years. The United States will dominate the world. It got so bad that on January 5th, 2003, the New York Times headlined its Sunday magazine section, American Empire, get used to it. The neocons were you know, flourishing in the Bush administration. And, but by 2005, things had gone so poorly in Afghanistan, so poorly in Iraq, uh, that Proudhammer was, wrote again and said, I was wrong. The unipolar era and the unipolar moment are over. The United States does not have that kind of power and control, you know, which we've seen. The United States has been unable. Yeah, we can invade Grenada in 1983 and defeat a couple dozen Cuban construction workers and wave the flag and say America's back standing tall and proud on its feet again. The Vietnam syndrome is buried. You know, we can do that. But military solutions don't work. We got involved in Syria, the secret covert CIA programs. At that point, the New York Times was saying that dozens had been had died in the Syrian civil war. We fueled the opposition there, Operation Timber Sycamore. It's led in part to hundreds of thousands of deaths there. When do we learn the lesson? We haven't learned that lesson. One, one person I don't usually agree with is Samuel Huntington, Clash of Civilizations. But Huntington had some insights on occasion, and he said the West won the world not by the superiority of its ideas or values or religion, but by the superior application of organized violence. Westerners often forget that fact. Non-Westerners never do. And we have not learned that lesson, you know, and, and it doesn't work at this point. And uh, the war on terror was a disaster. We've sown, but, but if you look at the neocons hit list, they said, well, after Afghanistan, we go and take Iraq. Then we take Syria, then we take Libya, then we do Iran, then we do Somalia. They had a list and they were all repeating this. That was their mantra. But we've seen what that's produced. Chaos, disruption, war, death, poverty, suffering. You know, we've got to begin thinking in different terms. Peter Kuznick, what an interesting discussion. I hope to continue with this in the near future. Thank you so much for your time. A pleasure. Thank you. And thank you for joining us today. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and to donate, because if you don't, we won't be able to produce independent and nonprofit news and analysis. My name is Zan Reza. See you guys next time.